In this case, the subject, Mr. Wilson, uh, was not cooperative and was actually acting violently in the back of that prison transportation van. This was all captured on our DMAP video. Uh, as you all know, the subject was uh, ordered and asked several times by Officer Caldwell to uh, cease and desist in terms of his violent behavior in the back of the van. And when Mr. Caldwell uh, did not comply, uh, the officer uh, uh, utilized pepper spray to gain compliance. Uh, unfortunately, our department policy, although it does allow for the use of pepper spray on a restrained suspect, and this suspect had the handcuffs in front of him, so he wasn't completely uh, restrained to, to, to the best of our both the hands in the back, there, our policy also requires you to utilize other avenues to gain compliance other than uh, pepper spray. And in this case, based on the tally of the circumstances, Officer Caldwell wasn't justified in the use of pepper spray. That's why he's been uh, suspended for a lengthy amount of time. And so with that, uh, I will, uh, then let me just say one other thing. One of the things that we look at as a police department, this officer's not been in any trouble. Uh, we've been looking to see if there's anything out there. We still haven't seen any other indication that this is a pattern in his part. Uh, in the disciplinary review hearing, he actually accepted full responsibility in terms of acknowledging what he did wrong, acknowledging that he had other options and avenues available to him to stop. Mr. Wilson from continuing with his violent behavior in the back of the van, uh, which, which included having other officers helping him apply leg restraints to the subject that we provide to our officers, and then uh, securing him uh, in a different manner, and he acknowledged uh, other things he could have done differently. And so one of the things that I consider as a police chief when we are uh, considering discipline is will the behavior continue or uh, has the officer accept responsibility what is their history? What is the potential for this officer to be rehabilitated and continue forward? And I'm convinced that uh, this officer will not be back. And if he is, and uh, with, after a 45 day suspension, he will not survive uh, anything even remotely close. So with that, I will open it up to any questions. So when this happens sometimes, whether it's in this department or other times, sometimes I hear officers say, you know, kind of off the record, like, oh, this is just happening because it's in the media. You know, this is just a high-profile case, and APD feels like they have to uh, be hard on this person because it was nationally covered. I mean, what would you say in response to that? Well, I would say that uh, a lot of folks that uh, have that frame of thought thought that the officer was going to get fired. They're convinced he was getting fired. And I've been a police chief here for over nine years, and I'm very proud to say that we've had plenty of instances go viral. Uh, not proud to say that, but because of the nature of uh, policing nowadays where we're under the most scrutiny of any uh, generation of police officers. There have been plenty of cases where, where, the, where community members or advocacy groups, this case being no different, where people want officers fired. They're not fired. We make our judgment. We make our decisions. Not based on which, win, which way the wind's blowing, whether internally with the workforce and the cops or the union or externally with the community. We have to make it based on professional judgment. And in this case, uh, the bottom line is that the very vast majority of actions taken by this police department when employees fall short are not a result of a citizen complaint. As a matter of fact, Mr. Wilson, to my knowledge, we still can't even find the subject in this case. He has not come forward. Okay? The very vast majority of our cases where officers are suspended, it's not because it's in the media. It's not because it goes viral. It's because we have a process where we look at ourselves, we police ourselves, and the vast majority of our cases, if anybody wants to take a look over the last nine and a half years that I've been here as a police chief, the very vast majority of our cases are self-initiated by the Austin Police Department because our review process, our assessment, and our team looks at something and deems it a violation of policy and we take the appropriate action. And I, I, I would recommend that you go look at the last, I stand by that statement and look at the last nine and a half years, and I can almost tell you uh, that that statement will, uh, the evidence will show that that's not true, uh, in fact true. What else? You said pepper spray was inappropriate in the situation. What would be appropriate given the fact that the suspect wasn't complying? Uh, well, in that case, he had, what, what my expectation would be is first of all, what are we going to try to accomplish here? And, and, and what he's using as an instrument to be violent are his legs. I mean, if you look at the video, he's kicking that door. 
Uh, we've had actual prisoners escape in the past from those vans that uh, they weren't secured properly or whatever. He's, he's at a Caritas uh, location where we have a booking area. He had plenty of officers he could have called to help him, open the door, and then use numbers. And I need more officers to go in, pin the subject, maybe put him in a control hold, then apply the leg restraints, and then tie him out. Uh, that he had other options that were available to him. And then you got to think about policing is ugly, right? I mean, uh, even when we do things perfect, they, uh, when you're trying to overcome resistance, it never looks, it never looks good. <clears throat> and so in this case, uh, his option that he should have utilized first was to control the subject with, uh, and actually, let's immobilize the legs. And then once you pepper spray him, what happened? Did the guy stop? Does anybody know the answer to that? No. No, he did not stop. He continued to kick. You need to immobilize the legs, and that's the way we're trained. When people are using their legs, whether they kick at the officers or quick up equipment or kick out windows or do the things that people, when under the influence of alcohol or drugs or mental illness or just angry, you have to immobilize the legs. That's how we're trained, and that would have been uh, the, the option that he should have uh, utilized. Uh, if you look at it the way it looks now, it just it, it was just not the way to go. You say, and, and he recognized that to his credit. You say that's how you guys are trained. How much do you take into consideration that the split second de decision your officer has to make out there? There was no exigency there. I mean, this wasn't a life or death situation. It's a guy in the back of a van kicking the van violently. But it was violent. But uh, we train our officers to understand uh, several things. And, and I have you know, personally have spent a lot of time personally talking to my officers about expectations. And policing, many, many times, and this case is no different, time is on our side. Numbers, which mean more officers, are on your side. Distance, cover, concealment are all on your side. In this case, there was no exigency, and if you look at the way you open the door and say, hey, knock it off, or I'm gonna pepper spray you, closes the door. Hey, knock it off, pepper spray you, closes the door. There was no exigency for him to just open the door, pepper and close the door. We've accomplished nothing, right? The guy just continued. We are better than that. Officer Caldwell is better than that. For those in the law enforcement, Officer Caldwell himself admits that he violated the policy in my hearing. And, uh, and he himself admits that he should have followed these other protocols that he had available to him.